Ron, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate the opportunity to appear with you guys. Give us a little why. Why? Yeah. 4K? Why, why, you, why you want to do this and why we should consider supporting you? Well, you know, I thought long and hard about this. I never ran for uh, partisan office. Uh, and I told my wife that uh, there's only one thing I ever really wanted to be, and that was the Attorney General. Uh, I was a Deputy Attorney General for during Neville Younger's period. Uh, I was a, a coordinator and leader at UCLA for the Kennedy Students for New America. I worked in Bobby Kennedy's campaign, and I was um, I was at the hotel, the Ambassador Hotel, the night he died. And I can remember after he died, writing a letter to the United States Attorney, saying that I wanted to be a Deputy Attorney General in the United States, uh, and I did. And uh, so when I went to UCLA and to law school and all that stuff, I thought that it would, you know, government service would be something I wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to have, have met a man by the name of Wiley Manuel, who ultimately became a Supreme Court Justice. Uh, and I uh, worked on the Welfare Reform Act of 1971 with the Reagan people. Um, and so I put in the time, and then I put in 25, 30 years uh, being a, a managing partner of two AV rated firms. And in the last year or two, I, I was uh, pretty much a sole practitioner. And we talked about so it. Let me, let me just ask you. So you were in the AG's office for how long? Eight years. And then you were with what firms? I, I was with Oldman, Cooley, Salas, Gold, okay. et al., uh, and Murphy and Gold, uh, which was my old partner, John J. Murphy, Jr. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, my son is a partner, actually, at the old Oldman firm now. Uh, but in any event, uh, I always uh, I had some ideas for a long, long time about how the Attorney General's office should be reformed, the kinds of things it ought to do. Um, and I felt that if the right opportunity came, uh, and I was still vital, that that's what I would do. And uh, while it, it appeared that this was going to be a difficult chore, uh, we were able to put together enough of a campaign to make the primary. Well, what, what are some of those ideas that you talked about that you well, need to be done? First, uh, uh, political corruption. Um, it kind of uh, not really offended me. It just, just seemed to me that we ought to have a political corruption unit in the Attorney General's office, which is a combination of the State Bureau of Investigation and criminal deputies. It, 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 uh, to, to, to think that the Calderon brothers and Lee and now some other uh, political personalities in Los Angeles uh, were indicted or slash arrested by the FBI and the feds had to come in and do the state's work seemed to me, and it has for years, just, you know, inopportune, uh, inappropriate, and that uh, the state ought to be taking a full lead in investigating uh, corruption. So instead of just saying standard fight corruption, I, I want to put in that unit in the Attorney General's office. Second, I want to put an environmental unit in. I want to call it the Cousteau unit. I'm talking to young Mr. Cousteau, the son, about doing some environmental issues that, are, that will make significant differences in farming, farming regeneration, water, etc. Third, I want to... I'm, I'm not sure I tracked that one. Okay, let me run through it, and I'll be no, back. No, no, okay, okay, go, go ahead. Okay, third one is uh, is elder abuse, and uh, I for the last 15, 20 years, I've done trials on elder abuse cases, and what would always uh, when Steve Cooley uh, ran, uh, I'd actually gone to a baseball game with he and a friend named Tom Beck, and we talked about putting an elder abuse section in the attorney general's office, and uh, we talked about elder abuse in the district attorney's office. I never thought it was sufficient uh, for the government to, to merely go after uh, abusers of the elderly, uh, with un, you know, given the undue influence, etc., without going after them criminally for what they had done, taking away people's property, taking away their life savings, uh, abusing them, whether they're family, friends, real estate brokers. There is a caretaker, um, a caretaker uh, statute, but beyond that, 
uh, more needs to be done. And I want a, I want an element within the Attorney General's office that's going to combine the, the criminal deputies uh, working on elder abuse cases uh, and with criminal prosecution. So uh, amongst uh, those are just part of, of the reasons I ran. Okay, let's back up to the Cousteau unit and explain a little more what that's about. Well, we've always had a, a what you might call a water resources board as an agency, and, and we've had uh, work on that. But I, it seems to me that everything from migratory practices of animals, abuse of animals, uh, clean water, and particularly water for farmers and ranchers, uh, need to be combined within a section of the Attorney General's office to enforce uh, rigid standards of, of cleanliness, of, of health, of safety. Uh, and much like in the old days when uh, uh, the oil companies uh, with regard to monopolistic practices were prosecuted by the Attorney General's office, uh, I, I think that an environmental section keying on some of the problems not just that the ranchers and farmers have, but regular citizens in California in terms of sufficient water, uh, not impeding migratory practices of birds. There's just so many things that need to be done that it could be localized into a single section. I know that section would be very popular with the deputies uh, because, you know, as a deputy, I always look, uh, you know, for special projects and special areas that that uh, enhance the, the welfare of Californians, at the same time were of great interest to all of us. So could you give an example of, of, um, of the kind of, I, I assume you're talking about going after crime. Sure. Uh, so clean water, um, could you give an example of the kind of criminal activity that you think is happening now that is not being prosecuted adequately? Well, it isn't just that it's a crime. Uh, sometimes regulatory functions in terms of, of diversion of water away from farmers and ranchers, uh, perhaps the quality of water ought to be monitored so that uh, health and safety issues are, are preserved. And in a criminal sense, uh, when dumping occurs, uh, that it, it be something that's being investigated on a regular basis. Dumping is very, very essential uh, to be investigated because it's not just the chromium and the met metallic content and the poisons that filter into water, but all of those kinds of things need to be watched carefully. And you can do that in conjunction with the local district attorney's office. And so those would be some, just a few of the examples that would be very helpful and at the same time would be a more proactive, in fact, the only activity that this Attorney General in that area, you know, has not, does not do. Why would that be an area that is not just left to the local DAs? Well, because, you know, first of all, the local DAs are, are generally overloaded with uh, what we call regular crimes. Uh, and, uh, white collar crimes, uh, hardcore crimes, gang crimes, etc. And there, is, there isn't a, as much a likelihood it's going to occur. When I was in the Attorney General's office, there was 150 deputies statewide. Now there's 1,000. There is a capacity in that office and a capability that could be fulfilled. And I'm pretty strong about that. I, I, it seems to me that that's something we ought to be doing. And it's a statewide problem. It isn't just a local problem. Well, one of the things it says on your website um, is that you'll create the trust that Californians used to enjoy between the leaders and the public. When was that? When was there trust? Yeah, because I've been here 20 years and I haven't seen it. Well, I, I've been here since uh, 1958 when I immigrated from Canada, but uh, uh, I think that the kind of uh, trust that they're talking about is, is, the, is the, the, the fact that uh, the government, instead of being intrusive, instead of it being uh, regulatory to the point where it, uh, it hurts uh, business people, uh, there was a, a working relationship. Uh, it wasn't just the Reagan administration. Uh, you know, the, we had uh, one of my favorite governors and one of the men that used to come to my office, and I was always proud that he did, was Pat Brown. And, uh, you know, he would, you know, he would uh, 
he would involve himself in, in those activities that, that I think the citizens of California appreciated Governor Brown, not just for the University of California, which developed, but uh, the Feather River Project, and so many other things that were helpful. And that, you know, that there was this bond between citizen and government to do constructive things that both parties can do. You see, I don't adhere to the policy that the Attorney General is a partisan office. <laughs> You're not, I'm, I'm a Republican, um, but I'm a law enforcement guy. I'm somebody who just wants to do the Attorney General job. Um, and I think that so long as this relationship between the public and the Attorney General is one of trust, and that between government and, and the Attorney General or, or any other office is, is adhered to. There have been times in our past when we have made great contributions and, and both parties have <coughs> adhered to respect, reality, and they have accomplished things. Uh, and there's no reason that it cannot happen now. Well, if you're a law enforcement guy, and I also understand that you're you have specific uh, opinions and interests about uh, Colorado's uh, marijuana law. Tell us about what your position is on that. Yeah, you know, uh, going back, um, I had a partner uh, when I was with Murphy and Gold, and John J. Murphy Jr. He was an old World War II guy. He served on the South Dakota in World War II. He was an FBI agent, and he was a New York cop. And I started working with him back in 79. Worked till, with him until 1995. Uh, and Jack always told me, and I learned from him, this isn't of recent persuasion that I have come up with a legalization of marijuana. Jack and I, uh, and many other law enforcement people, always kind of ruled the day that so many people with, you know, possession of marijuana was filling up county jails, state prisons, etc. But it's more than that. It's sort of a, so, so Jack and I always, Jack was purely a criminal lawyer. Uh, we, we always came to the position that, look, this, it doesn't make economic sense. Don't make criminals out of people who, you know, uh, who are doing that. And from a libertarian viewpoint, uh, people have the right to do the things they want to do so long as they don't hurt other people. And so it, it is, you can call it Republican, but of course there's, you know, a bunch of Democrats and independents who likewise uh, favor the legalization of marijuana. I understand that the latest poll showed something like 57.2 percent of Californians support the legalization of marijuana. Uh, it makes economic sense uh, because it brings in the kind of income. Uh, I, the last thing I saw was that uh, alcohol and tobacco on a yearly national basis, you're talking about $80 billion and $175 billion, respectively. And if marijuana were legalized, it would come close to the $175 to $180 billion. That would fuel important things for us to do, like drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs, infrastructure programs, education. Um, I think that the time has come for marijuana to be legalized. I think the time for uh, people to address these issues, it's, it's sort of the prohibition of our times. How does your party generally, I realize you, you don't see yourself as a partisan candidate, but how do Republicans react to that generally? Well, you know, I have a motto. I don't know if you saw it on my stuff, but it was like a new kind of Republican. And since... Uh, of the 18 volunteers on my panel I, working for me, now I've had to hire professionals, but of the 18 that originally got me through the primary, 14 are Democrats. So they always kid me and say, oh, yeah, you're a new kind of Republican, you're a Democrat. <laughs> 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 so, and one sense, some of them say, look, the Republicans are stuck with you. They didn't pay attention to what you do. <laughs> the, Democrats, the, the Democrats say, you're you know, you've got positions way, you know, to the left uh, of moderate positions of Ms. Harris. She refuses to come out for, you know, legalization of marijuana. We, we don't, you know, we have a, the tenure issue. You're on the side of the kids. She's on the side of the unions that are that are paying uh, her way. Um, and, you know, you go through all of the issues. I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I understand all of that. Um, but I, you know, I just think that, uh, and, and I talked to Jim Brulte one-on-one. Um, -on -one, 
and I, I was introduced to him by um, the state senator, former state senator Wyman, who was one of my uh, contestants, and who was fully supporting me as are all the remainder. And he says, yeah, I told Ronnie you ought to think about that one. And Rulte said to me straight up, he says, you, you, you may lose you know, some of the people on the far right, but the majority of the Republicans support the position. I'm not doing it because the Republicans support it. I'm doing it because I think it's right. Uh, I know I take a lot of criticism from my own party, um, but uh, I, I never think of myself as that partisan uh, in any event, and I'm not worried about it, and hopefully I'll get some Democrats and independents uh, to kick in. Did you ever run for office before? Not for any partisan office, no. For any office? Yeah, I, I, when the city of Calabasas became a city, um, I'd lived there two years, and I decided I'd like to be a councilman, but, and I came in sixth out of 13. But they only had five councilmen, so uh, uh, I, I've, I've always enjoyed politics, but I've been, uh, when I was in the Attorney General's office, I think you would call me a working deputy. I'm, you know, as Harris goes around town saying that she's the first woman, she's the first black, I go around saying I'm the first Jew, <laughs> I'm the first working deputy, and I'm the first immigrant from Canada uh, to want to be the Attorney General. I, it's, yeah, I, it's not, uh, it, it, politics in terms of running myself, but has never been something that uh, I've been overly concerned with. So help us understand, <clears throat> in your bio and your talk here real quickly, you, 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 the first scene that comes out is the Bobby Kennedy scene. It, 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 but you're a Republican, but, I mean, how do we wrap our, you know, yeah, you don't want us to put a, Fire some lens on this. I get that, but help us understand who you are. Sure, you know. Let me let me tell you a little bit. I, you know, I, I grew up in a poor family in Toronto, Canada. I, I, as 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 the story is true, uh, my parents couldn't afford a shoot of coal, and so every day I took my wagon to my cousin's house three blocks away, and I got a wagon full of coal. We were renters. We you know we came a long way. My family, my mother was an immigrant from Poland, so I understand immigration. She, she had come from Poland. My father's family was from Russia. Uh, we, uh, my parents struggled in Canada, a uh, <clears throat> product of a situation where almost all of our family was barred from coming to the United States because of some policies in the United States in terms of immigration. Uh, so our family ended up in Australia and England and in Canada. And I was, my mother, my father, my brother, and I were the only ones that came to the United States ultimately. But that was the goal for the whole family. Um, so I grew up in a, in a working class, less than working class uh, situation uh, with, with sort of tough times. Um, we were fortunate. Uh, I came, to, you know, as a kid in Canada, I, I wanted to go to UCLA because in the 50s, UCLA was a great football power. And I thought, God, you know, there's something called Berkeley. I thought the University of California was UCLA. I mean, that's how I grew up. Just give you a little background. I, so when I was there, are those who say it is. <laughs> <laughs> when I so when I got a chance to go to UCLA, you can't imagine how happy I was. And the other great thing in my life in Toronto, the professional baseball team we got was the Los Angeles, well, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Cleveland Browns in football. Well, in '58 when we emigrated. That's when the Dodgers came. So there's a Jewish expression called the Sheriffs, like it is, you know, it, it is supposed to happen. And I was like, God, I don't care what my parents are doing. We've never been to Los Angeles. I have no idea. We've never been further west than Detroit where we bought a car. So I, I, we were just fortunate. My dad went into real estate. Uh, the story is, you know, he made some money and we bought a house. And, you know, my brother and I both went to UCLA and, uh, and in terms of our political uh, things, uh, my uh, mother had uh, eight live births in her family. It was an Orthodox Jewish family. Um, they, uh, they were very much involved in union activity in Toronto. Uh, grandfather used to make hats at Tip Top Taylor. My uncle was a union representative. Um, we were very much labor-oriented um, and uh, you know, very, uh, you know, very involved in, in uh, uh, some political activity with regard to labor, but mostly, uh, you know, we just, uh, we always wanted to become American citizens. But 
so I went on to UCLA. I, I was very dedicated to Bobby Kennedy. I thought that he was the best of the Kennedys. I, I, you know, I loved uh, everything I did. There was a thousand students that I headed uh, at UCLA in my senior year. Uh, I, you know, I was uh, horribly upset uh, the evening he was killed, and I was there in the Ambassador Hotel. Um, and you know, I, the rest, in terms of who I am, there was. I always felt that uh, the Democrats, uh, the Democrats that I grew up with. Uh, were supportive of a strong national defense, supportive of strong economics for the working poor, uh, etc. And so I was, uh, this is tough, but uh, it, since it's what I did, I, I'll tell you. I, when McGovern ran for president and there was a, uh, a referendum or, uh, on the, uh, the platform that Zionism was equated to racism and it came within a single vote of winning, uh, it really hurt. I, you know, I consider Israel to be a strong American ally. I was very upset. Uh, I was concerned that uh, some of the Democrats, including McGovern, weren't as fully supportive of the military and the national defense of the United States. And like many members of my family, uh, all my brother, mother's brothers fought in World War II. Uh, several were injured. Uh, several had psychological serious injuries. Um, and uh, in 67, I tried to get to Israel to go fight with a couple of my buddies. But the United States wouldn't let us go because the plane didn't go from the United States to Israel. You had to go into Mexico, then go to Israel. But they wouldn't let me go because, well, by the time I went into Mexico, the war was over, thank goodness. Since I'd never told my mother, she would have killed me. <laughs> so you get a little feel for where I am. And so. I'm a Republican because I believe in family values. I'm a man of faith. Uh, both my sons were bar mitzvahed. Uh, I have two grandchildren. Um, I'm concerned for their future, and I'm concerned for the state of California and its future. You know, I'm not a goody two shoes. I, you know, but on the other hand, I'm about as simple and easy a guy as you ever want. So, you want to ask me whether I ever tried marijuana? I can answer so quickly. No, I couldn't tell you the difference between a licorice stick and, and a and a joint. In fact, the word joint said, you know, sometimes offends me. So that's who you got. And that's who the Republicans are stuck with. Well, one thing you talk about is promoting the concept of one person, one vote, limiting the power of special interests. How's the Attorney General do that? Well, one of the things that, um, in terms of the problem, and I, God, this, is, this has been like on my mind a long, long time, uh, is we have 120 legislators, 80. 80 in the Senate, and 40 in, or 80 in the Assembly, and 40 in the Senate, and they each have staffs of 10. Even my friends who pay attention to politics don't know the name of their state senator or state assemblyman. You guys probably do because you're in the business. But trust me, most people have no idea who these people are. They hide in the dark, and, and they're not doing it. They're not always doing it purposely. But nobody knows. And 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 the thing is. You, you get these, these problems as a result of, of darkness, of, of secretiveness, of undue influence. We just have way too many people uh, you know, involved in, in uh, elective office in terms of legislature. I'd like to see, like Nebraska, a, unilateral, a, a unicameral a legislature just with limited people so we'll know who our representatives are and we can put more pressure on them and, and keep them aware. <laughs> you know, I'd like to see... Uh, I, I, the, the, about breaking up the state into five or six, it's totally absurd. We need more government officials like a hole in the head. It's what we need to do is to concentrate, make it one on one. And so when when I when we say that, you know, one person, one vote, I, I want it to be more significant. I want so what was that? <laughs> well, the attorney general's office uh, can promote uh, and work with. Uh, uh, legislators and give uh, attorney general opinions. I wrote in my time, I don't know, 15, 20 attorney general opinions uh, to legislators. And so when they asked the question about uh, making uh, it more uh, the uh, legislative branch more responsive, uh, uh, we sometimes you know write those kinds of opinions. And it's it's used as support for the legislators. It's used as support uh, sometimes uh, for the governor's office. Uh, <laughs> 
I know yeah, I wrote the opinions are not supposed to be speak to your particular point of view. No. They're supposed to be an interpretation of the law as it is. So again, it counts the relevance. Yeah, the relevance and standing is that the Attorney General is a law enforcement official. The Attorney General uh, opines on on the legality and on the efficacy of a particular uh, position. Uh, it's not necessarily, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not binding, but it is advisory. And the Attorney General can have that kind of advice. You're going to probably ask me questions about some things that I would appeal and others that I wouldn't. So to think that the Attorney General's office doesn't have discretion in some of these things, I think is, is not correct. It does. Uh, and like influence in anything, uh, I don't see myself as going out there and advocating. I know that my first job is to enforce the law as it is, and that's what I'll do. But I, you know, as far as encouraging a better California conjunction with the governor's office, who incidentally I represented uh, both Governor Brown and uh, Governor Reagan twice, uh, those, those kinds of working relationships of putting things together to make the state work better is, is, is not out of the uh, efficacy of, the, of what the Attorney General's office can do. It's not limited uh, beyond the scope, and it's not an, an encroachment on anyone else's power. I'm still trying to wrap my head around Okay, well, yeah, I mean, at least you know how I feel about it. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get your policy positions. Yeah, I'm just not sure how you use the AG's office to, to form your policy Well, positions. I'll give you an, another example. I don't know if I'm you know, going to connect with you on this, but uh, the incumbent uh, you know, takes credit for you know, getting cash back on the mortgage crisis. Well, there's a terrific, and I hate to say this as a Republican, a terrific attorney general in New York named Mr. Schneiderman. And he did almost everything. And she sits back and takes the credit for, you know, for something he did. You know, I mean, so the Attorney General, like a Schneider, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, makes policy by what he prosecutes and what he doesn't prosecute. So there, there is that element, and uh, it just so happens that the example I'm showing you now is a Democrat, but uh, that's my leanings. I'm, you know, I, I do it by policy, and I do it by, by uh, uh, translation of what law enforcement uh, needs to do. And that's how my mentors at the Attorney General's office taught me. So whether it was Evel Younger or, you know, or, or the uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, or any of the rest of them, um, I had a pretty good feeling and they were pretty good to me. And I, I remember particularly Elizabeth Palmer, who was the first acting uh, female Attorney General out of San Francisco. And she used to discuss these things about the impact we as Deputy Attorney Generals could have in our AG opinions, in our, in our ties to the community and what we can do through the AG's office. It's a wonderful opportunity for an attorney uh, to serve uh, the citizens. And I, it was the best eight years of, of my, my uh, legal career. If you were the attorney general, would you appeal with the bar decision? No. No, I, I, again, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's the children or it's the unions. Uh, I know she's she being Harris is supported and she gets her financial strength from the unions. I come from a union family, so I'm I'm not per se against unions. But when it comes to the kids, um, I taught when I was at UCLA at a Braddock Elementary School. I taught law school in Los Angeles uh, evenings when I was in the Attorney General's office. Um, I know that there are thousands of really good teachers. But there's some really bad apples, and I took away a lot of licenses at the Attorney General's office for breaches of moral turpitude, for criminal acts, for incompetence. Uh, and to have tenure as a bar to some wonderful young student teachers that, that really you know, need to be in the system uh, at the cost of just having senior rights uh, overwhelm uh, the situation, I, I think those and minority kids who just deserve better, just deserve a whole lot better. So I'd be interested to see whether I've written a, a press release that was issued weeks ago, maybe a month now, as soon as the, the GAR opinion came out. In fact, I had a trial in front of Judge Rooktro just uh, last week. But he, um, I, I, I 
we made our position clear from the beginning. I'm calling on her, you know, not to overturn it. Ron, have you followed the case of the issue revolving around the president of the California Public Utilities Commission, Michael Peavy, and his relationship with PG&E in this area, and also with the nuclear power um, plant down south? Um, are you familiar with? It? If you're not, it's okay. But if you are, I, I was going to ask you if, if you would be considering taking. If you were Attorney General, whether or not you would be investigating him. But if you don't, I'm familiar with this fine. I have another question for you. The other question would be: Is is where are you on the death penalty? Well, I have a um, a personal and a public opinion. Um, uh, Nicole Parker uh, was uh, well. Ed and Lori Parker were dear friends of mine when I was a a manager at Sunrise Little League. And Ed and Lori were apart for a while, and Ed was watching Nicole only a couple of blocks from where I live. And we all went looking for Nicole because we couldn't find her. She was seven years old. Nicole, uh, Nicole was raped and murdered by Ed's next door neighbor and put in a closet. It was found the next day. It's been 17 years since he was given the death penalty. And so for the court, this federal court, to say that it's cruel and unusual punishment to wait 25 years to be executed, it just, it just kills me. I, Parkers will never get Nicole back. It's been 17 years and no closure yet. Raped her. Kidnapped her. Killed her. You know, I as part, when I was doing some cases in San Quentin for the Attorney General's office, the the warden wanted me to sit in the gas chamber. It's a two seater. I think I'm one of the few people that ever sat in it and walked away. And I know what a it really affected me in terms of that plane ride home, because as strong an advocate as I was for the death penalty, it was you know it was. I think I talked and blabbed about that for a long time. I think my wife's tired of hearing that story. But as far as rapists and kidnappers of, of youth and murderers like that, or cop killers, I, you know, my position is real strong. Uh, death penalty stands. As far as you know, sometimes uh, what we call the felony murder rule or or associated murders that uh, you know maybe crimes of passion. I think that's a different story. I don't think we ought to have, you know, I think we ought to be reasonable and, and clear-cut. And I respect several of the, of the district attorney's offices that have really good uh, positions on reviewing which cases should call for the death penalty and which shouldn't. Uh, so I'm, I'm reasonable, but I am colored by, uh, by Nicole Parker, and uh, I, I support the Nicole Parker Foundation. So it, it seems, um, ideologically, I, I understand that, but, but it does take years and years and years and a fortune to try to execute people in this state, and, and it doesn't seem to happen. At, at some point, is it, is it just better to put them in jail and throw away the key? I mean, I, I, and I'm thinking for, for the survivors as well. I mean, that's, that's a horrible thing to have hanging over half your life. Yeah, you wouldn't want to say that to, to Ed and Lori. They, they're waiting every day to get their justice. Do you think they ever will? Their daughter is, is been murdered and raped. Do you think they ever will get their justice? They'll get the most amount of justice they can get. Never going to be sufficient. Nothing's going to replace Nicole uh, for any of us. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. I know that, you know, the system, and some people say is broke, and some people say you know needs change, and, and I agree with all of that. But it just doesn't take away from the act so barbaric, so heinous uh, that some things just go transcend, uh, you know, the, the norm, and this killing a seven-year-old girl, raping her, 
Oh, I, you know, nobody's arguing about the seriousness of the crime. We're just saying it doesn't happen in California. I mean, they can't even find a drug that works. It well, just, I'm yeah. just curious because you, yeah. you, you know, I, I think I understand. You're saying that the survivors don't need closure. They just need to keep going for as long as it takes to get the death penalty. Well, but, I guess it's more than that. I, I, I was at the California Club. One of the little perks you get when you win the primary is that people invite you to stuff that otherwise little people like me, working class folk, uh, don't generally get. And, and so Justice Corrigan, the Supreme Court Justice, she uh, was talking about uh, uh, you know the, the death penalty, and this was before the Arizona situation, which you know, obviously makes us all think about it. But you know, she was saying you know that part of the problem is that we pay uh, these capital lawyers $140 an hour that we have four different lawyers uh, assigned at various stages of the goes from the state courts and it goes then to the federal court appeal system. Now this this guy that killed Nicole, I mean, he's still in the federal court appeals. He's had four lawyers. You know, I mean, I mean, somewhere along the line, people got to say, and you're right. You know, there has to be an efficient, you know, reasonable way of, of handling the, the death penalty. There has to be a due process thing that doesn't go on 25 years. The justices weren't all crazy in terms of saying it, you know, in terms of what they were doing. But, you know, but by God, we could do better than that. And, and, you know, it's hard to get lawyers at $140 an hour to do a capital case. That's a lot of responsibility. So, um, Ed, Ed's first question kind of got buried. Are you familiar with the PUC situation? No, I'm not. Okay, sorry. Here's my other question for you, Ron. So, four years ago, we supported Steve Cooley, and his primary focus was on ending political corruption. And he couldn't beat her, and I think he was a lot more widely known as a political question. He was a lot better known than you are, I, I think. And so, why do you have a? Why are you, you know, in, in good position to beat her this time around? Well, I'm advised, you know, you can only pay your advisors and they probably tell you what you want to hear. But I'm told, <laughs> I'm told that uh, although Mr. Cooley was highly experienced and I had seen him in trial, uh, he was like a real lawyer, you know, someone who tried cases. <laughs> uh, Steve uh, and I had gone to a baseball game with he and another friend named Tom Beck at Sun Angel came with him and I was going to help him do an elder abuse section in the AG's office. Um, Steve um, had some some difficulties in his election in terms of, I guess, a question about the pension, whether he's going to take his $180,000 a year pension, and he didn't think it was a big deal, but people seem to have thought it was. But more importantly, why, why do I think that I can take her on? Is, I think, the momentum of your question. And let me tell you why. I have, I, I know my people tell me that if someone says, here are Ron Gold's positions on these issues here, marijuana, elder abuse, political corruption, and here's Harris, tenure, I don't know, this, 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 uh, who would you vote for? And I'm told that I have a substantially narrow lead with respect to those people. I also know that, uh, you know, that uh, we're in the age of the internet. And I'm going to make inroads, as I did in the primary, going up and down the state. I have a van that I use. I've got 14 people on this volunteer committee. I've hired a campaign manager, a solicitor. Uh, I have people here in Sacramento who issued my press releases. Um, we are, we are, on, you know, we are actively engaged in a full statewide race. Uh, there'll be everything from emails uh, to a fully supported campaign in terms of funds. She won't beat me because I won't get, because I'm going to get overlooked because of the money. She can try to ignore me and she play chicken little and ignore me as much as she wants. She's sitting with the three and a half million dollars. My brother Howard, who happens to be a lawyer, says, you know what AG means for her? And I said, what's that? And he says, almost governor. Well, I'm not running for almost governor. I'm running for this office. And she's, she's going to have to make a choice. You know, what, I was at Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt said something about, you have to bloody yourself in the arena. You've got to involve yourself. It's bad for democracy when she plays the silent game. She's going to win because she's going to be quiet, and, and she's going to you know, think that I'm not going to go after her. 
I am. And I'm going to go statewide, and I'm going to do the kind of thing. This is one time shot for Ron. So either I'm going to, you know, so I'm going to do it with everything I've got. So you're saying you're going to go after her. Give give us an example of of where you think she has gone wrong, uh, missed an opportunity, or passed on an opportunity that she should have taken. Well, it, it's I, actually it's fairly easy. The candidates always say it's fairly easy. But uh, for example, her her two, you know, one of her two big items is that she's going after the gags. Well, the FBI crime lab and statistics came out last week and said that California ranks 16th worst in the nation. Mississippi is better than us. New York is better than us. Texas is better than us in violent crimes. And she's working, uh, her big thing is how she's curtailing gangland activity and, and crime. <clears throat> what has she done about elder abuse? Little or nothing. You know, what has she done about political corruption? Did she even occur to her that she ought to be looking into uh, situations involving the Calderons or, or Lee or anybody else? Is, is that just... And, and one of the reasons that it's unhealthy for, for the entire state to be Democratic holders, and this would be the same if we're the Republicans, and we've had periods of time when Republicans have run this state. Uh, but the one good thing about having a Republican Attorney General is that you know the fox doesn't get loose on all the chickens. Uh, whether she's you know ignoring it or just not doing anything or waiting for the district attorneys and the federal bureau of investigation to do her job, it's California's job. It's the corruption here in California, and she's she's aloof and not involved, and she's waiting her time to become governor. And I, you know. I'm not in her mind, and as you would say, counselor, you know, uh, what you, you know, relevance and hearsay, it may all be true, but she's not. You ask a regular citizen, what has Kamala Harris done in the last four years? Just ask them. You're not going to get much of an answer. I think that's probably all from us down here. Okay. Guys, if you All right. I do have oh, another question. Wait, but sorry. I mean, you guys go ahead. I don't want to dominate here, but I also sort of curious your position on gay marriage. I, I support gay marriage. I, you know, I don't have a problem with uh, you know people. Again, I'm, I have a libertarian bent in the sense that I think people ought to have the right to do what they want to do. Uh, you know, and uh, um, there, you know. People are productive. They're full citizens. They ought to have full rights. And so I'm not opposed to that. I, in fact, uh, like many of you, have friends who you know have either married or become partners, and um, I'm well at ease with that. I have no issues with respect to that. How would you support? How would you have handled Prop 8 in the AG's office every day? You know, that's that's you know I've been asked that question, and I and I've thought more about it. Um, uh, but I, I think that uh, I would probably let it stand to the point that uh, you know that any challenge to it uh, constitutes a violation of the, of the rights of, of, uh, uh, of gays and lesbians. I I just don't want to limit the rights of anybody. So that's just not going to happen. Uh, that's not something I'm going to do. You know, it's it's one thing with you know maybe the death penalty and tenure and some of those things where I can have uh, impact. It's hard for the Attorney General to avoid some of the questions. My primary focus will always be to uphold the law as it is, but sometimes the constitutional protections are so vital and are, are so important that you just, you cannot take someone's constitutional <coughs> rights away. Just, so I, yeah, I, you know, I understand that that sometimes doesn't make me popular within my own party, but, but believe me, there are an awful lot of Republicans who are come around to a lot of these positions, and uh, you know, I, I don't see myself as a big leader of the Republican Party, but uh, uh, I'll do my job. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you well, thank much. you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you very you. much, Ron. Appreciate sure. it. Thanks. Thanks a lot.